8. So if you want to turn with me there to your copies of God's Word as we come uh, to our uh, you know, last uh, little uh, talk about uh, the um, uh, you know, doctrine of baptism. Uh, next week we're going to start uh, looking into the Lord's Supper. Uh, but tonight uh, we again are closing out with the Great Commission. Uh, in Matthew uh, chapter 28. So go ahead and turn to me there as we go to the word of God. Again, we'll start there at verse 16. Hear the word of the Lord. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority uh, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for this word that you've given on this day. And to God, we pray as we speak more on the blessings of baptism. Uh, that you will use this time to strengthen our own baptism and our own reminder of your covenant promises. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now again, you know, this is the Great Commission, right? The, uh, the passage that we know uh, so well. And the context, of course, is that Jesus is preparing to uh, ascend, right? You know, the ascension that we read about in uh, the first chapter of the book of, Luke, or of uh, Acts. And uh, Jesus has kind of given them their last minute instructions. And so the 11 disciples are with him, right? And of course, what happened to the 12th disciple? Right, you know, Judas has long since passed the sick, right? So the 11 disciples are with him. And as has been the pattern throughout uh, the Gospels, Jesus takes them away, right? They go to a private place, uh, to a mountain, uh, which Jesus had appointed for them. Right, so a place that, uh, that, that Jesus would, uh, you know, had prepared beforehand that they would uh, be there. Now, you know, there's a lot of speculation about what mountain we're talking about here. Right? You know, a lot of folks think it's Mount Horeb, you know, the, you know, Mount Carmel. Right? There's a number of mountains it could be, but what does Matthew say? He doesn't, right? So should we spend a whole lot of time worrying about it? No, right? Um, it's one of the things I've become more convinced about the older I get is that if the Bible doesn't tell us, it's probably not a good idea for us to sit around and, and uh, speculate, right? Because that usually leads us into places where we don't need to be. So the important thing is that Jesus takes the disciples away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted, right? Now, who, who likely is this referring to? Thomas, right? You know, we don't, you know, one of the beauties of the Gospels, of course, is that every Gospel writer doesn't tell us the same thing. That way we get a, a fully orbed picture of what's actually going on. So they come, some doubt, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, uh, the first thing he says in verse 18, all authority has been given to me uh, in heaven and on earth. Right? So this is the testimony from Jesus that he has received from the Father, right, all authority on heaven and on earth. Now, that means Jesus is the king of the earth and the king of heaven. Right? So if all authority has been given unto him, uh, should we worry about the situation in the world? All right. well, at least we shouldn't be anxious about it because the testimony is, is that Jesus is in charge. Right? He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now this authority that he talks about right, is not just for the, the, the church, but also the state, right? You know, the civil government is as much under the kingship of Christ as is the church. Now, Paul relays this information to us in Colossians 1 and Ephesians 1. Now, the reason why that matters and why it's important is because of the content of the Great Commission, right? You know, the, the actual action language in the Great Commission, right? Why uh, can't, you know, why should we go out unto all the earth? Well, because Jesus is in charge and Jesus is in charge not just of the church, but of the nations. And according to the Great Commission, what does Jesus want us to do to the nations? Right? Teach them everything that I taught you, right? You know, disciple the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all things I have commanded you, right? So 
that's the, the, the basics of what he has taught them. Now, on, on Sunday morning in God's providence lately, we've been in the Gospel of Luke uh, in the quarterly, and you know the last two quarterly lessons um, have involved uh, the sending out of the first of the 12 and then the 70. And you know, as we talked about, the sending out of the 12 and the 70 are kind of like dry runs, right? They are a preparatory mission. You know, I can't remember if it was last week, two weeks ago, but I talked about, you know, that one of my jobs I had when I was, uh, you know, a, a younger man is door-to-door sales. And uh, I turns out I didn't really enjoy that very much. Uh, that's kind of a unique uh, line of work uh, that God has not blessed me with the patience for. Uh, but, right, one of the things they often do when they're training you, right, is they don't just send you out, right? They send you out with somebody to train you how to do it, right? And so the, the, the sending of the 12, sending of 70, was to prepare them for this moment, right? This is where the rubber hits the road because where's Jesus going? To heaven, right? He's not going to be there to, quote, unquote, hold their hand anymore, right? They're going to be, you know, in a sense on their own. However, right, he's not sending them alone. Right? He's sending them with the Holy Spirit and obviously with his authority, you know, the Apostle Paul will talk about, uh, we can, I hate to peep myself in this morning, but um, the, you know, with the, the, the mysteries of the kingdom, right? With the, 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 the mysteries which we understand to be the sacraments and the message of the gospel. Now, as they're sent out, right, they go on his authority, right? Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a unique thing for him uh, to tell them to do, right? to baptize. Now, in the Old Covenant, you know, as we've talked about before, right, baptism in the Old Covenant was circumcision, right? Now, who was allowed to be circumcised? Eight-year-old boys, or, or eight-day-old boys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, eight, yeah. <laughs> I hate to think trying to circumcise a bunch of eight-year-old boys. That, that's hard enough to get them to take a bath. I can't imagine <laughs> doing that, but, right, eight-day-old boys, right, and was Israel at any point in the Old Covenant told to go and to circumcise the nations? No, right? You know, there was uh, an insular part of the Old, old Covenant, right, and however, now we hear in the Great Commission, who is to be a member of the nation of Israel in the New Covenant? All nations, right? You know, in Galatians 3.28, right, we hear that promise, there's neither male nor female, neither slave nor Greek, you know, neither Jew nor Gentile, right, that all are one in Christ Jesus. Now, the idea here, again, is that they are to receive this sign, you know, but uh, what first needs to happen to the nations before they can be baptized? Right, they have to be discipled, right, before you baptize them, right? So in other words, if you're sent to a nation, you don't go baptize everybody and then disciple them in the name of Christ. Now, you know, why, why does that make sense? Right, they need to understand what's going on, right? You, you don't randomly walk up and baptize people, right? You know, partly because we understand that baptism is not salvation, right? We understand you're not saved by baptism, right? You know, baptism is something that comes from covenant membership. You know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sign that comes after the discipling. Now, as they go out and as they make disciples of the nations, right, one of the first things we always see happen, when somebody comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, what happens to them? They get baptized, right? You know, the Philippian jailer, you know, the people at Pentecost, you know, you know on and down the line, right? And the first thing that happens is they're baptized. Now, as we talked about with the Philippian jailer, Right? Who gets baptized when a Philippian jailer comes to faith? Him and his whole household, right? So now we have an old covenant picture of this when it comes to uh, the preaching of Jonah. Right? You remember, when Jonah goes and preaches to the Ninevites, you know, who is the one who converts? The king, right? And then what does the king tell everybody to do? To, you know, to, to repent, right? You know, and, and so one of the things we see in the Old Covenant is a picture of what New Covenant uh, discipleship or baptism looks like, right? When the, the head of the nation converts, the whole nation then becomes 
you know, a member of the covenant and everybody is baptized. And again, we see this in real life uh, because what happens when Constantine um, you know, is converted at the Silvian Bridge? You know, what does he do not long after that? He declares that the whole Roman Empire is now a Christian. And now, does everybody overnight automatically become a Christian and go to heaven? No, right? But there is a, there is a way of the change that happens in everybody's life because almost overnight you go from being an enemy of the state to being a friend of the state, right? And that's a wonderful thing, right? We'd much rather live uh, where the nation is openly Christian than be persecuted. You know, there's some people running around today who have this complex who they, that they want to be persecuted, right? And, you know, why, why should we not want to be persecuted? Because it hurts, right? I mean, it, it doesn't need to be more complicated than that, right? Uh, I'd much rather, right, live in a peaceable place where I'm free to preach the gospel and confess faith and not worry about, you know, losing my job or going to jail or worse, Right, happening to me. Now, part of the goal here of the Great Commission is to change the nations, right? You know, so that the nations themselves would become uh, believing places. And again, baptism flows out of that discipleship, out of the preaching of the gospel. And again, it's, a, it's noticeable, again, that the Great Commission includes that term nation, right? Because when we hear the word nation, right, we immediately think of like nation state. Right, of you know, France and United Kingdom or United States or Guatemala or whatever, right? But in the Bible, right, is that how everything was set up back then? No, right? There weren't hard and fast uh, boundaries like there is today, right? Nobody had to get a passport back in the first century. Uh, you know, so the idea here in nations is really more ethnic groups, right? It's more in the understanding of Romans and Gauls and you know, you know, the Germanic tribes or the Celts or, or Celts or, you know, whoever you want to you talk about, right? And so when we think about it in that context, right, we're, we're back to thinking of people groups, right? We're back to thinking of folks like the Philippian jailer. So there, there's more of a covenantal understanding of what's happening in the conversion of the nations uh, than merely, you know, Constantine coming to faith and everybody in Rome becoming a Christian, right? The idea is, is that you go to a tribe, right? You know, and you, you, know, you, you preach the gospel uh, to the tribe and the chief con confesses faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we see, you know, the outworking of that. Now, you know, we also see something about the nature of the baptism that's very important, obviously, for today. Um, you know, when we see the baptism, what's the nature of the baptism? In whose name is it done? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Now, we see in the New Testament, what's the means of baptism? You know, how, how physically are you baptized? With water, right? Now, does it matter how much water? <laughs> no, right? Um, you know, I use a little bit more water than some Presbyterian ministers, but you know, I want to make sure it takes, I guess. But, you know, the, the idea is, right, you know, there's lawful ways to baptize, right? And, you know, you can be baptized by immersion. You know, we call that irregular in, in our form of government, right? If somebody came to me and was just convicted, you know, conscious bound to be immersed, you know, I would do everything I, in my power to try to convince him or her that that wasn't necessary. But if that was really a stumbling block, then Romans 14 says, you know, what should I do with the weaker brother? Right? I should, you know, it's not sin, Right to be immersed, uh, so I would we'd go down to Mr. Jimmy's pond or wherever, right, and I would immerse them in the water. Now that's again not the ordinary way we do it. However, right, the 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 real thing that matters, as we see here, is the name in which we baptize somebody. Right, if you're not baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, can you can it be said that you were baptized? No, right. You know, so, and also one of the other aspects we see here is not just the name, but it's the authority that comes with the baptism as well. Uh, you know, you have to be baptized in the church. Now, again, that doesn't mean you have to be physically baptized inside a building, right? But you have to be baptized into the church. You can't just baptize somebody into, into the ether. You know, every now and then I'll get requests, uh, 
you know, it doesn't happen as much as it used to, and I think it's, part of it's just because of cultural Christianity dying away. But every now and then I'll get a request from like a grandma or somebody to, you know, have their grandchild baptized. Now, their, their, the, the grandchild's parents, you know, aren't interested in the baptism. Uh, as far as I can tell in most of the situations, the grandchild themselves is not in church. Uh, but the grandparent wants the grandchild to be baptized, right? And, of course, there's good intention there, right? You know, the idea of wanting your grandchild baptized is good. But, you know, the reason why I don't baptize in that situation is because, you know, you, you, why, why do you think I don't baptize in that situation? Well, yeah, the parents are unbelievers. That's a big problem. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the Bible teaches that one or more parents have to be believers in order for a child to be baptized. But, you know, why else wouldn't I do that? Right, you know, it, it, you know, it's, there, you know, one of the vows, obviously, that we take when we baptize is one of the vows is taken by the church, right? So, you know, if, if I'm just laying water and saying, Father, Son, Holy Spirit on a child that is not going to have a church family to support it, you know, I'm kind of making a false statement, right? Because there's, and y'all would be making a false statement because there would be no way for you to keep that vow if the child is not a member of the church, right? Is not a member of the local church. And so one of the things we see in Matthew 28 is not just, right, that the baptism has to be with water and with the you know, Father's Holy Spirit, but it has to be done in the context of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? It's one of the uh, you know, vital parts of it because, again, we understand that the nature of baptism is a sign of, uh, of being brought into, right, the covenant family, right? And we believe that the visible representation of the covenant family is the local church, right? So, you know, I can't just baptize somebody, uh, you, you know, for the sake of, you know, whatever thing you want to you know, apply to that. Now, the, the other aspect of that, too, is, is that, you know, if you were baptized, you know, the, the example I see used a lot is, you know, if you're at summer camp at Bon Clarkin and or if you're at summer camp wherever, and your camp counselor, and you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, let's say, and you've never been baptized before, and, and your camp counselor takes you down the creek or down to the pond or down the lake and baptizes you, uh, is that a lawful baptism? Let's say they say Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, why would that not be a lawful baptism? They the right, they don't have the authority, right? You know, part of the understanding of ordination, right, of, of, of that kind of authority is, right, the church is the one giving the minister the authority to oversee the baptism, right? So the, the, the minister is not acting on his behalf, when he's baptizing, right? He's acting on behalf of the church and then ultimately on Christ's behalf, right? So it's only those who are authorized, right? That's where the authority comes in again here uh, with baptism. And it's only baptism done in the context of the church that's lawful, right? Uh, I've, had, I've had this happen before where somebody, uh, this was in Ellisville, it wasn't here, but somebody came to me and that was their story. That was their baptism story. They had been baptized at a Baptist youth camp when they were 13, 14 years old. And I kind of had to explain to them that, you know, that's not a, a lawful baptism. Now, they didn't take that very well. Uh, but, right, you know, you can't, <clears throat> you know, the reason why you have to take that seriously is because it is a serious thing, right? We don't mess around with the sacraments, right? They're very serious matters. Now, the last thing we'll get into here as we you know, you talk about the nature of this baptism that we see in the Great Commission is that as you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right, going back to the one vow that we make as a congregation, is that when you're baptized in the church, right, you are uh, you know, making a promise yourself. Now, obviously, you know, I've yet to have an infant speak during a baptism, and if I had an infant speak during a baptism, I'm... I'm not sure exactly how I would handle that, but, right, you know, that we believe that even the child is making a covenant in the act of baptism. And one of the covenants that's being made in baptism 
is that uh, you desire to observe the things that have been commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the larger catechism, uh, Westminster Larger Catechism, talks about it in this way, that, that, that we are called as baptized individuals to improve on our baptism. Now, that doesn't mean our baptism, when it's first done, isn't complete. What it means by that is that, it, when, especially when we're struggling in faith, one of the things we can do to encourage ourselves in our weakness is to look back at our baptism, right? Be reminded that a promise has been made to us, in us, and through us, and by us, you know, that we are bound together with the Lord Jesus Christ. So in that, right, we are showing and being reminded uh, that our God has, holds us in his hands, right? And so we seek to observe all the things that have been commanded, in order that uh, we uh, might uh, be you know, kept uh, both by the authority of Jesus Christ but also by the actual act of baptism itself, right? And again, you know, closing, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, right? That's the, that's the confirmation promise of the covenant of baptism, right? Is that if we are baptized by faith and in faith, the, the assurance that we have in our baptism is that Christ will be with us always, even to the end of the age. And one of the, one of the things about that, too, is that, you know, you know, I'm sure we all know children who have been baptized in the church who show no fruit of repentance, no fruit of faith, no testimony whatsoever to, the, to, to any Christian life. Now, one of the things that you should do with a child like that you know, is remind them of their baptism, right? Remind them uh, that God has made a promise to them, right? To, to call them back to that covenant that has been made. Now, you know, you, you, one of the reasons for that is, you know, you show them, right, the nature of God's love for them even if they don't love God, right? Even if they, you know, say all kinds of nasty things about the Lord, right? The, the reality is, is they've had a sign placed on them. Right? And God's not going to forsake them and forget them. Now, does that mean that they're going to go to heaven just because they're baptized? No, but what it means is, is that, you know, something serious has been done to them and for them, and that is, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a spiritual weapon, if you will, uh, that we should use to encourage, you know, wayward baptized believers to come back into uh, the family of God. We see that happen in the Old Covenant. When the prophets come and preach to the, to, to the lost tribes of Israel and to the people who have wandered away, that's their calling card, is reminding them of the promises that God made to Abraham, right? Remembering the promises that God made in the covenants of the Old Testament. And we'll kind of uh, go ahead and close at that point. But any uh, questions or comments about you know, the way the Great Commission kind of fills in with, with baptism? All right, well, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for this time and for this evening as we uh, discuss these matters, we think about these matters. We pray that as you encourage us in baptism and as we uh, come together next week to look at the Lord's Supper, we pray that uh, your, uh, your, your covenant hand will be on our hearts. And in Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, our benediction tonight comes from the, the first chapter of the, God, of the book of Ruth. Hear the benediction tonight. Ruth 1, 16 and 17. Hear uh, the word of the Lord. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. Uh, for wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. Lord, do so to me and more also. If anything but death parts you and me. Amen.